Hello and welcome to the next part of the Let's Learn Victoria 2. In this episode, we'll be going through probably the majority of the politics panel, though we maybe not get through all of it, because as you can see, there is quite a lot to get through. But let's start off really simple with this main panel here. And uh, this little one, this little circle here, the colour represents what sort of political party you are. So say you're communist, reactionary, liberal, socialist, communist. That's what that colour represents, and this is the name of your current political party. Or ruling party, depending. You know, you can have a monarchy in this game. Now, this is the number here represents suppression points. And say, I don't know, there's a woman's right movement. You can use suppression points to basically suppress this movement for a while. So it'll disappear for a couple of years, but then it will come back stronger than when you left it. So it's a short-term solution to things that you don't want to deal with right now. My uh, voice is getting quite croaky. <coughs> Next, we have infamy. And infamy is basically how rebellious and infamous we are to other countries. And normally you don't want to get above 16 because then countries will try and attack you because you basically, you know, they think of you as a threat to international sort of relations to everyone. Everyone thinks that you're going to attack them. So you don't want to get that too high. And the higher it is, it will also negatively impact your chances to get alliances and get deals with other countries. So it can be really bad if this gets too high. So I always recommend try and keep it below 10, but definitely go and get it over about 16 or 18. And these will glow. I think I've got enough in the overview video. This will glow if we can make a reform. This will go if there is a decision we can make. This will go if there is an election in our country, and this will go if there is a rebel nation starting. And then when a rebel nation is fully formed, rebels will be put on the map, and will start capturing provinces. Right, let's click on politics. And you can see right now, uh, this is quite a mess. But basically, again, I'm going to split it up here, and then these two. So thirds for this page, and this is all about reforms. This section here. This represents here the type of government we have. So you can see right now we have Her Majesty's government. This means that it isn't an election based government. So you can see right now this is the upper house. Now the upper house is kind of like your political advisors. The top of the top of the politicals. Or the political leaders and the... Not leaders, sorry. Top of the top of your political advisors. So you can see 70% are uh, conservative. 18% uh, are reactionary and 12% are liberal. So you can see right now we are reactionary, but most of our upper house are conservative. Which means probably when we have the next election, it will change us to a conservative um, a conservative party because this is bigger. But with Her Majesty government, you need at least a 50% vote for a party to be become that party. Otherwise, a sort of joint party will occur between one party and another. So, you can see right now, uh, let's go to here actually, Plur plural, I can't say that word, plurality, the shared level of consciousness in our country. So this is basically, you know, people, it's hard to explain, but it can positively affect you, so you want this to be quite high. It's basically how people think of our country. And we have revanchism is revenge. So say if we screw over our people, we tax them to hell, we make them all in poverty, this will go up, people will start having rebellions. So that's the revenge people want for our country. Uh, we can't enact any social reforms and we can't enact any political reforms. Social reforms, political reforms. Now, this is where the beef is of the political sort of decisions and things you'll do here. Now, every party has five different policies for trade, econ economic, religious, citizenship, and war. And you can see right here, the reactionary one is protectionism, state capitalism, moralism, residency, and pro-military. Now, I'm going to go through every single one that is in France, which I think is everyone, for each policy. Now, you can see right now, protect uh, protectionism. Trade between nations is restricted. And you can see there it says minimum tariff, minus 25%, maximum plus 100. And you can see that reflected in the tariff bar here that we covered in budget. 
Uh, that is all we have so far for trade. There is also another one called free trade, in which your you can your country can freely trade between between other countries, and the tariffs will be reduced massively. So the max you can go is about fifteen percent, but you can reduce it to about minus a hundred. So that's very you know it depends what sort of game you want to play. I normally just go for protectionism because it's easier and you can make more money more easily. Now economic. You can see here there's a lot to do with economic, but there is basically, if I remember, state capitalism, laissez-faire, interventionism, and another one called... I don't remember the name of it, but I'll explain it anyway. Now, state capitalism, as you can see here, is basically... Um, people can freely create factories... And, you know, freely create projects and invest them and own factories. However, so can you. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. Both your capitalists can invest and, you know, make factories. But so can you. So if I want to build a factory, I can just go here. These are all the factories I can build. I can build a cement factory. And it works like that. And you can see the uh, fine print there. You know, investors can build foreign railways, yes. Capitalists can open factories, yes. And minimum, it also has an impact on tax, your economic policy. So you can see this one allows us to tax 100% state capitalism. Now if we go back, we also have Lazarus Fair, which is basically you cannot interfere in industry whatsoever. All the capitalists have all control over industry, you have none. You also can only do a maximum tax to a population of 50%. So I haven't quite learned the best way to sort of play this game in a Lazarus Fair. So I tend, to, I tend to avoid it, but that is sort of the beef of what happens. And you can see there are also factory outputs an extra 5%. And the next one we have is interventionism, which is kind of a lot like state capitalism, except we can't build factories. So capitalists can build factories, upgrade factories, same as always, but we can also just upgrade and subsidize and fund projects we can't build our own so if we go back to politics interventionism so if you want a little bit of fine print there it all is right and that does it for trade and economic next we'll go on to religious policies oh actually sorry i forgot to mention there is one more economic policy that I don't remember the name of, but that means that capitalists and everyone don't have any control of your industry. Only the state has control over the industry. And, you know, there's different reasons for picking each, but that is the four main economic policies. Next, we go to religious, and these are sort of self-explanatory. Moralism, church and state are a single body, and religious minorities face discrimination. So, say, uh... 90% of your country is Christian, 10% are Muslim, the Muslims will be, you know, picked on by both the people and the government. So if you plan to colonise places with different cultures and different religions, that's going to be quite difficult with moralism. Pluralism. pluralism. The state religion, so the religion of your country, is the most accepted, but others are also accepted, but just not as much. So this is better if you're going to colonise, because then they're at least accepted. And secularized, secularized, which means that religion is not really involved in politics, but the state still values religious and uh, ideas, essentially, and values. And there's another one called atheist, where religion is not represented in politics whatsoever, and you will normally find that in socialist parties. Uh, next we have citizenship policy. This is again very important for colonizing. Residency. Only people of your nation's primary culture are allowed to vote. Limited citizenship. Limited citizenship. Only people of your nation's primary and accepted cultures are allowed to vote. And you can see the assimilation rate goes up there. I'm not potentially sure what that is. Sorry. And full citizenship. Every vote is equal, and the assimilation rate again goes up. 
And I think that is how quickly other cultures come to not hate your country for taking them over. I believe. And that covers it for citizenship policy. So that's very important if you have a voting country like France is right now. Then the next one is war policy. And... Uh, there are three different types to my knowledge. Only two are shown here, but I'll go for the next one. Pro-military, you can see, is mostly about spending and organization rate. So we can see we can spend on military spending, which is here, 100%. There are no limits to what you can spend with pro-military. You can also see there, reinforced speed goes up. Uh, organization speed goes up. Cast a spell acquisition speed, which I go for in military, but is basically... When you want to go to war with someone, you need a reason, so you have to make a reason. And mobilization impact, which I'll go through in military as well. Anti-military, what you might think, you can't spend as much, rates go down, but you don't. they don't uh, take as much supply consumption, which we talked about before in uh, the technology uh, episode. Troops require food and ammunition, and they won't take as much for anti-military. So if you want to save a bit of money for a while, anti-military can be a good uh, pick. And there is another one called jingoism. And the difference between jingoism and pro-military is, pro-military is we need a strong military. Jingoism is we need an amazing military that can take over the world. So it will increase everything, your supply, consumption, your organization rate, everything. But what it also does is in the middle of a war, if you're winning, say you want, say you have a war to take over a state, right? So you want to take over the Rhineland in France. What you can then do is, if you're winning the war enough, you can add another goal. So you can say, we don't just want the Rhineland anymore. We also want half of your taxes, and that's what jingoism is. So if you plan to, uh, if you plan to play a very militarized country, jingoism is very important. And I should mention now that cuts are just going to be made as and when. I'm not really running on a timer right now, so if it runs over about 15 minutes or 10 minutes, I'll split it into the next part. But this is everything for this chat panel.